Scripture together with us. Krista, would you lead us? But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. Would you pray with me? Dear Father, we come to you this week confessing total dependence on you. We thank you for your spirit, Lord. We thank you for the truth that has changed us, and we pray that we worship in those ways. We pray for those in our congregation, Lord, who are going through difficult times. Lord, there is sickness and there is difficulty that has happened this week. God, specifically, Lord, I pray for the region. God, would you cover them? peace. Cover them in your love. Great physician, would you work in a mighty way. Lord, may we lift your name on high and confess that you are worthy of all praise. Pray all this in your holy and precious name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship our King Jesus.
I'm going to call the ushers forward as we take up our offering. This last week, we were able to send out some supplies to help with disaster relief in East Tennessee and in uh, North and South Carolina. Because you give, we're able to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I'll pray over this offering, and then we'll take it. Dear Father, what we own is first yours, Lord. So we give back from what you have first given to us. We pray that you will use it in mighty ways to see people come unto repentance, to see people saved. Lord, may you get all of the glory. I pray all of this in your mighty, precious name. In the name of Jesus, amen. The choir is going to sing one of our favorite songs, The Goodness of God.
on double duty this morning, but I'm more than excited to bring the word of God to the people of God this morning. We've begun a series in Amos, if you were here last week, uh, and last week we really focused on the nations, but this morning we're focusing a little bit closer to home on the people of God. You see, Amos, we underscored this, this series as royal words from a rural voice. Because if you remember the setting of Amos, Amos is an 8th century shepherd, a, a fruit picker is what the Bible says, from the land of Tekoa, in the southern kingdom of Judah. He's called of God to leave the field and be thrown into the furnace, as you would. As he stands up and boldly proclaims a hard message, the judgment of God upon the people of God. Primarily, he does it to the northern kingdom as well, so it's not even where he lives. He's going to someone else and saying, hey, this is what God has to say to you. Sometimes we get too focused on being justa, if you will. Too focused on being justa. Amos was just a shepherd. He was just a fruit picker. Perhaps you're just a teacher, just a farmer, just a housewife, just a salesman, just a butcher, just a baker, just a candlestick maker. Again, Amos was just a shepherd. A fruit picker, minding his own business. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't the son of one. He was just a small business owner in the rural land of Tekoa. So what on earth would Amos have to say to Israel? He didn't search this out. But because Amos stopped for a moment, he stopped making excuses that he was just a, and he began obeying God. We see throughout this book, last week, this week, and the next week, that he was used of God in a powerful way. Amos does not have a degree from Jerusalem Baptist Theological Seminary. But what Amos does have is much more rare and much more powerful, far more powerful. Amos doesn't have a master's of divinity or a PhD, but what Amos has is ears to hear from God. He has obedience to follow the calling of God, and he has a boldness to give his word. You see, if you're going to be just in life, Be just a faithful servant of God, and he will use you too in inexplainable ways. He uses the faithful ordinary to do the unbelievable extraordinary. So in chapter 1, as we discover more about this minor prophet, in chapter 1, God begins knocking on the doors of the neighbors. He goes throughout the neighborhood around Israel, and he begins knocking on different doors of different countries. He exposes the skeletons in their closets. He, he, he shows and calls out the wickedness of their way. But as chapter 2 comes, and we saw it a little bit more often, uh, more last week, as chapter 2 comes, the knocks start getting a little bit louder and a little bit closer. When suddenly... There God is in chapter 2, knocking on Israel's door. The door of his people. A message at first that seemed to be directed to others is now shown to spend the majority of its allotted discourse aimed directly at their own lives. We like it, perhaps... When other people are called out. We may not want to admit it, but I I think each of us can acknowledge that on some level. But what about when our hearts are exposed to the light? 
Oh, call out the homosexuals, the, the power-hungry politicians, the murderous Muslim extremists. But when you get too close to home, a little bit too close for comfort, oh, you're just meddling now. I have news for you, and we'll see it in the text today. The hound dog of heaven uses his word, the word of God, to convict your heart. Your heart. He moves into your area code, if you will. He steps into your household. He invades your personal bubble. He targets you with his word to change you. And that is the news that Amos has to deliver to his people that we'll see today. It's not the Ammonites, not the Girgashites, the Jebusites, but it's the Israelites, the people of God. And so as we survey the message that God had to the Israelites through Amos today in chapters 3 through 6, we will, by relation, hear the word that God has today for, as Paul calls it, true Israel. All of those who belong in Jesus Christ. The church today as we know it, we will hear through them what God has to warn us about. If you will, open up to the book of Amos. We're in chapters 3 through 6 today. I will not read the whole passage to you this morning. But throughout, I'll be giving you various highlights to show where the outline comes from and to show the focal points of Amos' message. But there are a couple of verses that we will read, so I do ask, if you will, if you are able, to stand for the reading of God's word. Amos chapter 3, and then we'll jump over to chapter 5, just a couple of verses. Amos chapter 3. This is the word of God. May the people of God listen. Amos chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Listen to the message that the Lord has spoken against you, Israelites. Against the entire clan that I brought from the land of Egypt. I have known only you out of all the clans of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all of your iniquities. Chapter 5, verse 4. <laughs> for the Lord, or yet the Lord says to the house of Israel, seek me and live. Verse 6, seek the Lord and live. Verse 14, pursue good and not evil, so that you may live. And the Lord, the God of armies, will be with you. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice at the city gate. And perhaps the God of armies will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it. You may be seated. I will punish you for all of your iniquities. Yet, even now, seek me and live. Let's pray. You're holy and righteous, God. You have purchased us with your blood. Lord, we seek not to take advantage of grace, but to submit to your leadership. God, the words of Amos almost 3,000 years ago are still relevant today. The people of God need to cling to God and not to other things. Father, would you take an x-ray as it is of our soul's condition, expose to us where we need healing, and may you receive the glory. 
Father God, speak the word of God through your servant to your people and get me out of the way. I pray all this in your holy and precious name in the name of Jesus Christ, who with his blood has saved us. Amen. Today as we discover this mystery, we're going to see two things. We're going to see the iniquity of God's people, and then we will see the inscrutability of God's patience. But first, the iniquity of God's people. And, and as we go through this list, think not of, of how much greater you are than these buffoons or those around you, but allow your life to be laid bare on the operating table of the Word of God as a great physician examines your soul's condition and your tendencies. Prone to wonder, wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We each have these tendencies. The first thing that we see of the Israelites, the iniquities of God's people, we first see their apathy. Their apathy. Or another word perhaps could be their laziness or their I don't careness of God's people. In the first area of apathy that uh, Amos exposes uh, through God's word is the apathy in their remembrance. Their apathy in remembrance. This is found in verses 1 through 2. This is what Amos says. He says, listen to the message that the Lord has spoken against you, Israelites. In chapter 3, against the entire clan that I brought from the land of Egypt. I have known only you out of all the clans of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all of your iniquity. By the way that the Israelites were living at this time, it seems as if they must have forgotten who they were. They must have forgotten what their history was. You see, those who were taking advantage of the grace of God must have forgotten the days in the past. The days when they were in the land of Egypt. The Hebrew slaves under the deep, dark bondage of intense slavery. When back then they would cry out for the grace of God. But now, a couple hundred years later, they're not crying out for God's grace. They're taking advantage of God's grace. They become apathetic in their remembrance. Now that the chains of, of, of slavery and the chains of sin have been broken, they have silenced their desperation. They have submitted to the chains of slavery again. They've forgotten how much God has really done for them. Christian, it is so easy for us to forget just how much God has done for us. Christian, never forget what God has done for you. When you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil, for the shepherd who guided you through those grassy fields and by those still waters is still with you. Remember the past. In the valley of shadow of death, he also led me through the green pastures. When the prowling prince of sin tempts you to fall into his snares of temptation, remember that he who freed you from those snares of slavery, from that bondage, is with you now. And in Jesus Christ, the New Testament says, the devil has to flee. Remember what he's done for you. As the hymn writer said, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, Count your blessings. Name them one by one, and it'll surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings 
Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. In the dark trials of the valleys of your life as a Christian, you have an advantage because you have history with God. You know that he has not left you and he will not leave you now. You know how good he has been to you, so it encourages you all the more to follow him. So they're apathetic in their remembrance, but also they have the sin of apathy in their repentance. Apathy in their repentance. They were lazy when it came to repentance. In Amos 4, 6 through 11, this is what God has to say. <laughs> We're just the same way, y'all. I gave you absolutely nothing to eat in all of your cities. A shortage of food in all of your communities. Yet you did not return to me. I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. I sent rain on one city, but no rain on another. One field received rain, while a field with no rain withered. Two or three cities staggered to another city just to drink water, but were not satisfied. Yet you did not return to me. Verse 9. I struck you with blight and mildew. The locusts devoured your many gardens and vineyards, your fig trees and olive trees. Yet you did not return to me. Verse 10. I sent plagues like those of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword, along with your captured horses. I caused the stench of your camp to fill your nostrils. Yet you did not return to me. Verse 11, I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a burning stick snatched from the fire. Yet even still, you did not return to me. God is accounting, bringing back to their memory all of the times that he tried to grab their attention. Wake up! Yet every time, they chose not to. God demonstrates here multiple opportunities. They had to repent. He's, he's not pronouncing judgment out of nowhere. Like, God, where did you come from? We haven't heard from you in forever. No, he has warned them for a long time. Even sending plagues to try to push their hand to repentance. I'm going to judge you. I'm going to press you until you repent. And they're still hard-hearted. Friends, God is so gracious to us. We are so ignorant at times. In our Christian walk, God gives us opportunity after opportunity to repent, to walk closer with him. And then sometimes we pick up our head, look around us, and we see that we've fallen into deep sin. And we wonder, how did I get here so quickly? This sin came out of nowhere. But the truth is that God was warning us all along about the direction that we're heading in. And we chose not to repent. We chose apathy instead of repentance. A notable pastor who perhaps has influenced my ministry more than any other popular pastor just two weeks ago, the news came out. He's in his 70s. He had been in a secret relationship with a 20-something-year-old girl for five years. That doesn't come out of nowhere. You don't just wake up one day and you're committing adultery. There's a slow process. I've heard this. Sin is like a boxer. If you watch... 
Oh, no, maybe not Mike Tyson. He'd just knock you out right away. But if you watch an, a regular boxer, they're giving you body shots slowly, slowly to weaken you down, to weaken you down, to make you a little bit more tired. They'll dance around the ring to make you a little bit more tired. And then once they've gotten you to a certain point of just being tired and over it, that's when they give you the right hook and knock you out. Sin is the same way. It tempts us and plays with our minds. And, oh, there's just a little bit of a sin here and a little bit of a sin here. And then when you're not looking, you're five years into adultery. Friend, temptation is tricky. Casting Crowns had a song on Caleb that I remember growing up called The Slow Fade. And they say these lyrics. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's the second gl glance that ties your hands as darkness pulls the string. Be careful, little feet, where you go. For it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. Thoughts invade. Choices are made. A price will be paid when you give yourself away. Because people never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. The Israelites for centuries had been in a slow fade. From worshiping God and free from the bondage in Egypt... To all these heinous sins we're going to see today. A slow fade. Christians, avoid this slow fade. Take this as a warning sign. Don't be apathetic. Don't be lazy about daily repentance. Fight sin. So the iniquities of God's people, first, they were apathetic. May it never be true of us. Secondly, they dabbled in the sin of oppression. The sin of oppression. And the first sin of oppression that we see is social oppression. Social oppression. In chapter 3, we read in verse 9 the, the, the first glance at this sin. He says, proclaim on the citadels in Ashdod, in chapter 3, verse 9, on the citadels in the land of Egypt, assemble on the mountains of Samaria, and see the great turmoil in the city. The acts of oppression within it. Chapter 4, verse 1. Listen to this message, you cows of Bashan, who are on the hill of Samaria. Women who oppress the poor and crush the needy. And then in chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. Talking about the people that hate the one who convicts the guilty. At the city gate. They despise the one who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and exact a grain tax from him. Down to verse 12. I know your crimes are many. Your sins are innumerable. You oppress the righteous. You take a bribe. You deprive the poor of justice at the city gate. Israel, the people of God, seem to almost find a sadistic joy in oppressing other people. These rich, wealthy women, these cows of Bashan that they're called in chapter 4. These rich women were oppressing the poor. The government entities were oppressing and taking advantage of taxpayers. The wicked were oppressing the righteous. And it wasn't a systematic, or it wasn't a systemic issue. It was a heart issue of those within the system. We don't preach a social gospel. Let me be clear. We don't preach a social gospel at Brownsville Baptist Church. But friends... The gospel of Jesus Christ has social implications. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ changes how we act within the world. We need to act out physically to other people what God has done for us spiritually. We do not oppress the poor, for if you remember, it was us who were spiritually bankrupt before God, but he had compassion on us. We do not oppress the needy, for it was us who were needing spiritual life, and God had compassion on us. We do not cast aside and ignore, ignore the social outcasts, the homeless, the prostitutes, the cross-dressers, the drug dealers, the swindlers. For if you remember, it was us who deserved to be cast out of the presence of God. But he had compassion on us. The people of God are not to be well-fed cows oppressing the poor and the needy. But we should be radically compassionate neighbors who, like the good Samaritan, stop along their day, see the need, and meet the need. There's a lot of brokenness in Haywood County. There's a lot of brokenness in anywhere that you go. There's a lot of hurting, marginalized, looked down upon people in our city. And I would that God would raise up Brownsville Baptist Church to be Brownsville Baptist Church. To be a church that is not so caught up in our own bubbles. I'm guilty of this. So caught up in our own bubbles that we don't see the needs around us. I'm not saying you have to go out and street preach in front of Walmart. But I'm saying if you're in line and there's a woman swiping all of her different cards and trying to find money, you step in and meet her need and share the love of Christ with her. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16. We've memorized it since we were kids. Let your light shine before others so that they'll think you're impressive? No. So that when they see your good works, they give glory to your Father in heaven. Haywood County would change in a week if we got serious about shining our lights and pointing people to Jesus. Social oppression. The second oppression that the people of God fell victim to was domestic oppression. So we have social oppression and domestic oppression. In chapter 4, verse 1, we see this pretty clearly. Chapter 4, verse 1, Amos says, listen to this message. You cows of Bashan who are on the hills of Samaria. Women. Oppressing the poor, crushing the needy, but also who say to their husband, bring us something to drink. The idea in the imagery here is of these rich, lavish, self-obsessed women who are having parties after parties and indulging themselves in all kind of wicked debauchery, knowing that at any moment, their husbands will meet their every need and get them whatever they want. Domestic oppression. The word here for husband is actually closer to the word for Lord in the Hebrew or the word for master. And that kind of adds to the irony. It's a play on words. That the man who is supposed to lovingly lead his wife, which is God's design for marriage, is instead being treated as a pitiful servant catering to her every indulgent desire of these oppressive women. You see, God's word does not simply address how you act in the public square. God's word does not just address how we act within the church setting. God's word has much to say about family dynamics. 
You see, these people knew from the order of creation that the husband, as Adam was, was to be the head of the house as a loving leader. And that women were created to then join him as one and be his helpmate. That they are equal in value, but they are complementary in their role. That's a radical word today. So often the temptation of the enemy is to say, hath God really said? And to take the words of God and to twist it into his own design. The domestic realm of the home is never to be oppressive. Whether that's the wife oppressing the husband, the husband oppressing the wife, the parents oppressing the children, or the children oppressing the parents. What the family looks like should be a joyous gospel presentation. Redeemed people, unified and working together as one to God's glory. It should be a gospel presentation, not a playground for the enemy. But too often, way too often, the enemy has a field day in our homes. We come to church and never want to talk about it. Oh, we're doing great. And that very morning you had arguments and issues and bitterness. God comes to redeem those situations. I pray that this is true of your home. That no oppression is found within its doors. But rather that there's harmony in God's design. If it's not, Pastor Ben and I readily offer biblical marriage counseling. Not our opinions, what God says. So we can see domestic peace and not oppression. Thirdly and lastly on the iniquities we see falsehood as an iniquity of the people. Falsehood. It's, it's seen in chapter 3, verse 14, firstly. It says, I will punish the altars of Bethel on the day that I punish Israel for its crimes. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. Come to Bethel and rebel. He's being sarcastic here. Come to Bethel and rebel. Rebel even more at Gilgal. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer leavened bread as a thanksgiving sacrifice. Loudly proclaim your free will offerings, for that is what you Israelites love to do. Chapter 5, verse 21. I hate. I hate despise your feast. I can't stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Even if you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will have no regard for your fellowship offerings of fattened cattle. Take away the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Verse 25, house of Israel, was it sacrifices and grain offerings that you presented to me during the 40 years in the wilderness? But instead you have taken up Sukkoth, your king, and Kaiwan, your star god. Images you have made for yourself. The first area of false worship is false worship to idols. False worship to idols. You see, the Israelites were trying to Double dip as it is. Thinking that they can both worship Yahweh and that they can worship pagan deities. Jesus says clearly in Matthew 6, No man can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other. That means no one can. Whether that's God and Molech or God and money. Whether that's God and Lotan or God in lust, God in Shadrapha, or God in self. No man can serve two masters. Jeremiah deals with the same tensions just a couple years later. He says, 
Do you burn incense to Baal and follow other gods that you have not known? Then you come and stand before me in this house that bears my name? And you say we are rescued so we can keep doing these detestable acts? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers? Yes, I have seen it. Who or what else are you trying to serve? Are you trying to balance God and work? God and selfishness? God and lust? You can't serve two masters. They've also had false worship to God. As a result of idolatry, their worship to God has become a sham. It's just a gimmick. You see, when you fill your life with idols, your time before God becomes insincere. Because your heart's not really in it. You have other priorities in your life that you would rather be spending time with. And there may be seasons where you have to force yourself to get up and to worship God. But your life norm should be genuine worship. Free from idolatry. Not just going through the actions. We don't worship God. We don't come on Sunday mornings because we have to go to church again. We come on Sundays because we get to worship God. The one who sent his son to die for us wants us to sing to him, to worship him. When you understand in your heart of hearts what God has done for you, it's a no-brainer that your worship be genuine. They didn't understand, and their apathy led to false worship, but it also led to false security. We'll look at chapter 5. In verse 3, as he's pronouncing this judgment, he says, The city that marches out a thousand strong will only have a hundred left. The one that marches out a hundred strong We'll only have ten left. Verse 9. I will bring destruction on the strong. It will fall on the fortress. Verse 11. You will never live in the houses of cut stone that you've built. You will never drink the wine from the lush vineyards you have planted. Verses 18 to 20. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. What will the day of the Lord be for you? The day of the Lord will be darkness, not light. It will be like a man who flees from a lion only to have a bear confront him. He goes home and rests his hand against the wall only to have a snake bite him. Won't the day of the Lord be darkness rather than light? Gloom without any brightness. In verse 13 and 14 of chapter 6. You who rejoice over Lodabar, you say, didn't we capture Carnaim for ourselves by our own strength? But look, I'm rising up a nation against you, and they will oppress you. Israel had two areas of weakness where they had placed false security. The first was in their possessions. I think this is shown very well in the Gospels, in Luke chapter 12, when there's this instance of uh, the rich fool, as we would call him. He has these barns of grain filled to the top. He has a successful season. He says, what do I do with all this wealth? I'll just build more barns so I can um, have even more wealth to myself. He sits back at the end of the day, kicks his feet up, and says, Saul, you have done well for yourself. Eat, drink, and be happy. And then it says, but that very night, the Lord demanded his soul of him. And he said, you fool. You have wasted your life. People talk a lot about financial security. Security in their possessions. But ask anyone who has lost everything. Ask them how secure they felt. Because of their possessions in that moment. You see, God uses finances in many powerful ways. 
But giving us ultimate security is not one of them. When you are more secure in your bank account number than you are in your identity as a child of God, your money has become an idol. Secondly, they have false security in their position. They falsely believe that because they are Israelites, that they have security. Because we have the name Israelites, because we have the name the people of God, we're going to be okay. But there's a difference between blessed assurance and presumptive assurance. They presumed that because they were in the right place at the right time, that God would be gracious to them. They didn't understand that it's about your spiritual position, not your physical location. You see, you can spend the afterlife outside of the gates of heaven even though you spent your present life within the walls of the church. It's not about where you are or what you are doing to impress God. It's about your heart. And they falsely assumed they were safe in their position. So we see all this iniquity. It's been pretty rough. But then we see the inscrutability of God's patience. The inscrutability of God's patience. By inscrutability, I simply mean the mystery. The inscrutability of God's patience, if you will, the mystery of God's mercy. In chapter 5, verse 4, we see these beautiful words. The Lord says to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Verse 6, Seek the Lord and live. Verse 14, Pursue good and evil, not evil, so that you may live. Perhaps the Lord will be gracious to the remnant. The mystery of God's mercy. The inscrutability of his patience. With all of this iniquity built up, how on earth does God give a caveat? But seek me and live. That's not natural to us. When someone has sinned against us, there's no going back, buddy. I got a grudge for the rest of my life. But the mystery of God's mercy, that enemies can become friends, that children of the devil can become children of God. Many people try to figure this out and give language to it. The doctrines of salvation. There's people all over. There's Arminians and Calvinists and everything in between that try to put into words how God's salvation works. But you can't unscrew the inscrutable. You can't demystify the mystery as it is. The only response that we can have is that of Paul in Romans 11. That after he's talked about salvation, he says, Oh! Oh! He's a great linguist, Paul, all these great words. But in Romans eleven thirty three, 33, all he can say is, Oh, the depth of the riches, the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments. How inscrutable, how untraceable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from God, through God, and to God are all things. To God be the glory. What does Paul have to say about the mystery of mercy? The inscrutability of God's patience? He says, oh, how amazing. First we see the plea that God gives. Seek me. Seek me. He's not asking them to give any more outward actions to show. But he wants them to actually mean what they are doing. He wants them, if you will, to stop acting 
and start actualizing. Stop pretending and start meaning. We go through the motion so often. Just a couple pages back in Joel 2, this is what another prophet has to say. Joel 2, 12 to 13. <laughs> Calling for repentance. Even now, turn to me with all of your heart. Fasting, weeping, mourning. Here's the key. Tear your hearts. Don't just tear your clothes. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes. And just afterwards in Micah 6, 6 through 8, what should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before him on high? Burnt offerings of year-old calves? Thousands of rams, ten thousands of oil. Should I give my firstborn for my sins? The offspring for my sin? Verse 8 of Micah 6. Mankind, he has told you what is good and what he requires. To act justly and to walk humbly with your God. And finally, Jeremiah 7. Verse 3. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Correct your ways and your actions, and I will allow you to live. Do not deceitfully chant, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Instead, correct and act justly, and I will allow you to live. Church, God wants our apathy to become fervency. He wants our oppression to become aid. He wants our falsehood to become genuineness and true. Colossians 3, Paul says, seek the things above. Seek God. Don't seek the approval of man. Goes both ways. Standing next to someone and raising your hands because you want them to think, oh, he's really worshiping. And also being afraid. If I go down to the altar, what are they going to think is going on with me? Don't seek man's approval. Seek the praise of God. Seek the Lord, unbeliever. Seek the Lord, Christian. That's his plea. Seek me and his promises and live. Seek me and the promise and live. This is the mercy. This is the grace of God. If they repent, they won't receive judgment. And if they repent, they will receive life. What a simple message. Seek the plea and the promises that he'll give you life. I'm going to ask Miss Mary Jane to come forward and play the piano. But if you are drawing breath here this morning, it is not too late to listen to the words of Amos from God to his people. I'm not sure what sin has ensnared you this past week. I'm not sure what indulgence you have dug your heels into. I'm not sure what you've done this week. I'm not sure what you've done this month, this year, in the past decade. But it is never too late if you are drawing breath to seek the Lord and live. 1 John 1, 8 through 9. John points out that if we say that we don't have any sin within us, then we're lying. But if instead we confess our sin, then God is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. John Owen said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Let us be a people of God who seek him and find life in this barren land. Let us be a people of God who confess our sins to him regularly. Let us be fervent, compassionate, and genuine in how we live out the gospel. And then we will see revival in our church and revival in our county. Lord... 
I would that you would send revival on each heart in here this morning. Spirit, would you blow? Would you pray with me?